You're listening to K-Talk Radio, KBJA 1640 AM, Sandy, Salt Lake City, and all across the Wasatch Front, bringing you live, local, two-way talk. News this hour from townhall.com. I'm Ron DeRockstra. President Biden's first two foreign leader visits to the White House are designed to put China on notice. The president met with Japan's prime minister on Friday and will welcome South Korea's leader to the White House in May. Press Secretary Jen Psaki says those two in-person visits are significant. The uh, leaders of Japan and South Korea send a message about how vital and important the relationships in that region, the stability in the region, security in the region. The Biden administration is making no secret about the importance of strengthening U.S. alliances in the Indo-Pacific to deal with global challenges, especially with an increasingly confident and assertive China. Greg Clugston, the White House. A doctor for imprisoned Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny, who's in the third week of a hunger strike, says Navalny's health is deteriorating rapidly and the 44-year-old could be on the verge of death. A judge today ordered former Italian Interior Minister Matteo Salvini to stand trial on kidnapping charges for having refused to let a Spanish migrant rescue ship dock in an Italian port in 2019, thus keeping the people on board at sea for days. Here at home, hard-right House Republicans are discussing forming a new group. A policy platform for the group, which calls itself the America First Caucus, declares that, quote, America is a nation with a border and a culture strengthened by the common respect for uniquely Anglo-Saxon political traditions. House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy tweeted Friday that the Republican Party is not the party of, quote, nativist dog whistles in an apparent response to the document. McCarthy wrote, America is built on the idea that we are all created equal and success is earned through honest hard work and it isn't built on identity, race, or religion. Members of the House Freedom Caucus agreed. Bernie Bennett in Washington. General Motors and LG Energy Solutions plan to invest more than $2.3 billion to build a second U.S. electric vehicle battery factory in Tennessee. More at townhall.com. If you have back pain, shoulder, neck, hip, knee, or foot pain from exercise or even just getting older, you must order the three-week quick start now. Discount it to only nineteen ninety-five to see if it will work for you too. I think it could. Give your body what it needs to heal itself. Go to relieffactor.com, call 800 800- 500-8384. ReliefFactor.com. It's Saturday, 3 o'clock. I'm Steve Reinhardt. I'm your host. You're with KTalk AM 1640, the voice of Utah, broadcasting since 1955. KTalk's now in its 56th year on the air. And I've been doing this now for 14 years, 15 years, maybe even 15 and a half years. It's been a while. Anyway, I, I appreciate the chance to do it and to be with you each Saturday and to bring you issues of culture, history, politics, and religion. Hey Talk brings you live, local, two-way talk. I know because I trademarked that expression for the station. <laughs> and we invite you, our listeners, to call in with questions or comments that you may have and chime in on any topic that we happen to be discussing. The phone number is 801-254-1640 in Salt Lake City, Provo and Ogden. We used to have different numbers in Provo and Ogden, but it got confusing. And we're still trying to transition listeners over from our old AM 630 frequency to the new AM 1640 frequency, which we've now been on for two years, so it's really not that new anymore. Anyway, we'll look forward to hearing from you, our listeners, if you feel like chiming in. I am pleased to have with me in studio David Pine who has a very professional resume, but is actually a close friend of mine as well. So rather than telling you all about my friendship with him, I'll tell you about his professional background. He is a former commissioned officer in the U.S. Army and a former county desk officer for U.S. Army headquarters staff. His country responsibilities included mainly the Soviet Union. He's currently the deputy director for the National Task Force for EMP Operations, and he happens to be a licensed attorney uh, here in Salt Lake City. Dave recently authored a white paper for the Biden administration with recommendations on how to deal with EMP and cyber attack threats to the United States and has previously wrote sphere of influence pieces on China and Russia. I'm pleased to have him here. Dave, thanks for being here. I've got a number of questions for you. Yesterday, the Biden administration raised the alert status to DEFCON 3. Where does this put us? What are the chances of 
Russia actually going to war with Ukraine? And what would that look like if that happened? So I think the chances are increasing. I don't think it's imminent. We're kind of in a prelude to war. I, I've called this the Cold War II, essentially. I wrote, I've been writing editorials online for the last 19 years. And when President Putin came to power, he came into power on the last day of the 20th century. It was December 31st, 1999. He, he, he became acting president of the Russian Federation. He's ruled as a dictator ever since, and he's you know extended his terms another uh, 16 years so that he'll be, he would, will have been president for 36 years at that point. However, there was a clear turn, and I, I was, you know, I was um, working in the Department of Defense um, at the time, and there was a clear turn. You know, he, he's a former FSB director, the FSB, of course, being a successor organization to the KGB, mm-hmm. the Soviet KGB, he, in which he was a lieutenant colonel. So uh, he's very well schooled in intelligence and in uh, disinformation. He and China, President Xi and China, have been waging uh, an information warfare campaign, part of their low intensity conflict against the US over the last several years. And part of that is perception management. And he's also been involved, obviously, you know, um, under Putin, you know, he's take, taken aggressive action against uh, the Chechens. He waged war against the Chechens. That was a war that preceded his, his tenure as president of Russia. And then he also um, invaded and, and took control of part of Georgia, former Soviet, Union, Soviet Republic of Georgia, and then most recently Ukraine. He's basically re-annexed Crimea. And so... Since 2014, since the color revolution, which caused that conflict, Russian uh, supported uh, separatists have taken control of part of eastern Ukraine, the Don- Donbass region. With regards to Ukraine, the current Ukrainian president, you know, he is elected up to power on the basis of kind of supporting the, the Minsk agreement, which was um, a Russian supported agreement to allow greater autonomy by the, the eastern Ukrainians, uh, which are basically Russian Russian linguists, you know, they're pro-Russia for the most part. And then the Western Ukrainians are kind of anti. So there's a lot of politics going on, but the president of Ukraine has uh, lost a lot of, he lost popularity for that. And then, so he kind of switched positions. He's, he's now been very aggressive against, uh, against Putin and the Russians. And he's actually cracked down on pro-Russian politicians in Ukraine in kind of a d- dictatorial fashion that even we shouldn't support. Doesn't Putin ever burn out? I mean, this guy's going to be in his 80s before we know it. Is he ever going to slow down? Or is he worried that if he slows down, he'll be taken out? So President Putin is, he is, um, his dictatorship, he's cracked down on, on Russian dissidents. Um, any, any potential rival to Russia, um, he has poisoned, assassinated, you know, or, or, or in some way, you know, attacked to make sure that, that they can never defeat him. They can, okay, so case that, in point, Navalny. Or, Navalny, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So... That Navalny was poisoned by Russian intelligence, and uh, he's believed to to be near death at this point, and that's that's part of he's the. A, he's on a hunger strike right now in prison. Yeah, you, so you can't imagine he's going to last long in there. Yeah, so President Vladimir Putin, his number one goal essentially is to um, re- retake control of the former Soviet Union. So there was there were fifteen Soviet republics of which uh, Russia is one. The Baltic states, which are part of NATO, are some of those Russian republics that he'd like to get back. But the number one um, foreign policy objective of, of Russia is uh, abroad is to take take back Ukraine. Ukraine is the, the second largest so former Soviet Republic, has a population or did uh, of nearly 50 million people, and is you know strategically located. They have uh, good resources. They were actually a, a nuclear power uh, briefly after the former uh, after the Soviet Union dissolved. So what kind of action, or probably with Biden being president, inaction, might the United States be guilty of that would prompt Russia to invade Ukraine? So one of the things I wrote, wrote about in my sphere of, sphere of influence propo- peace proposal um, that was published in World Net Daily back in October of 2019, that I also tried to get it to, my sister was friends with uh, the then National Security Advisor, uh, Robert O'Brien. Um, unfortunately, she did not, did not get it to him. In time before before the Trump before the Trump administration ended, but um, one of the ideas is you know we really need to promote peace with Russia. Uh, so Russia is is a lot of our listeners probably don't understand that Russia and China have been allied by treaty since July two thousand and one. 
So for the last 20 years, they've been treaty allies. They have a military alliance that's called the Shanghai Cooperative Cooperation Organization, which Putin himself has called a second Warsaw Pact. And this alliance controls probably 80% of the world's uh, nuclear weapons. They have about five times more nukes than we do, uh, than the United States does. Our allies have a few more. Um, and a lot of resources, you know, 80% of the rare earths, about 71% of, of the population, I think, of, uh, no, about 40% of the world's population. Um, and about 20, I think 25% of the G- GDP of the world. Um, China has now exceeded the U.S. both as the world's leading economic and manufacturing power, um, and their combined military might, you know, is exceeds our own um, quite substantially. A lot of people, you know, especially at talking to our politicians. I remember I, I went to a meeting with um, a U.S. congressional candidate who's actually now running for uh, RNC, or not RNC chair, Utah GOP chair, and she told me, um, you know, she's like, I understand. That you know, the U.S. is the, the world's sole surviving superpower, essentially, that we have a uni, unipolar world. Um, if that, I don't believe that was ever true, but it, it's definitely not true now. The world it we live in... It seems like a naive statement for her to be made. It's extremely making. naive, and it's why, you know, we've... U.S. politicians have uh, disarmed the U.S. of uh, 94% of, of our nuclear, nuclear might, nuclear arsenal, since 1991. President, 19 out of every 20 bombs. Yeah. President George H.W. W. Bush, he disarmed um, 40% of our nuclear arsenal at the time. His son disarmed 50% of what he inherited. Um, by comparison, Obama only uh, disarmed about 10%, Clinton about 20%, 20 to 25%. So it, the two presidents, Bush, are most responsible for the, the uh, state of military crisis and weakness that we live in today. Uh, the fact that... Uh, the chance of nuclear war attack on U.S. soil are far higher higher than they ever were during the Cold War. And this is off topic, so forgive me for digressing a little bit. In retrospect, do you think Bush the first, Bush the second, and Trump were good presidents? I mean, we're both conservatives. Yeah. Do, do you interpret Bush's presidency differently so many years after the fact? Or, well, you know, you think? it's as as all. There's a nuanced question. I, uh, every president has good and bad. I mean. Um, let me share the fact that I support Biden's proposal to withdraw fully out of Afghanistan. That, of course, he's delayed that right by four months from Trump's plan. Um, mm-hmm. So there, every you know, every president has good and bad. Um, president Bush, uh, the first, you know, he did a lot. He did manage pretty successfully, um, you know, the collapse of the Soviet Union, the, the crisis that was involved with that. I think his attack on Iraq was a, a, a serious mistake that led uh, directly to the war on terror. Uh, the Al Qaeda attacks on on the Twin Towers and the Pentagon, um, where I was working two miles away back on September 11, 2000. So, I mean, in retrospect, I think both President Bush were uh, Bushes were uh, pretty bad uh, for our national security. They they did a lot of bad things that and that we're suffering from now. I ask because that seems to be the growing sentiment among other people I know who are less informed than yourself about national security matters. Yeah. Who also just start to see that or have that perspective as the years roll by, even people who are very supportive of both Iraqi conflicts. You know, I, sh- I guess yeah. I they wouldn't be Iraqi conflicts, but conflicts in Iraq. What about Trump? So President Trump actually, you know, he, he's, he did a, a really good job, I think, overall on foreign national security policy. Um, to his credit, he only disarmed us of 11 and of our nuclear weapons versus, you know, thousands of by Bush and the two presidents, Bush each. Um, you know, our nuclear arsenal was just reduced by 11 Minuteman three ICBMs that had been pre-scheduled by Obama to be uh, disarmed, disarmed and dismantled. Um, so he, and he, um, you know, he repudiated a lot of our, the bad treaties, uh, America oh. last treaties uh, that, that oh, yeah, the uh, Iran. his predecessors had signed the, the Iran uh, nuclear, I call the Iran nuclear P- appeasement pact was a big part of that, you know, where Obama and, and Biden gave $152 billion uh, to the Iranian terrorist regime um, on the promise that they would stop developing nukes, which they didn't. And actually, they used that web. Uh, I don't have any uh, direct sources, but I believe they used that money to weaponize nuclear weapons, and they're likely in nuclear power today. Iran, they already have an operational nuke. Most likely, think. yeah. Where does this put us all? I mean, Russia and Ukraine... China and Taiwan. Yeah. One would follow the other, you think? 
one so, war would follow the other. What I've been warning for and what I've been worried about for uh, several years now is is what I what I would call a two front war, where the U.S. is faced with multiple crises at the same time. Um, that would be the Russians invading Ukraine and possibly the Baltic states as well, which are part of NATO. Uh, while the Chinese, uh, more or less at the same time, would invade uh, Taiwan uh, and try to forcibly remake make that uh, part of China. Because they're um, opportunists. Yeah. They would take advantage of the conflict. This well, often happens in war. So this is, no, if this happens, yes, they're opportunists, absolutely. But they're also military allies, and they've been exer- having nuclear war, uh, you know, exercise, mock nuclear war fighting exercise against the U.S. for, for many years now. Um, increasingly close, you know, like uh, there were actually Chinese troops on Russian territory that were uh, participating in these mock nuclear war exercises. Um, also, a, a potential thir- third front, a three-front war, would be uh, North Korea invading South Korea. You know, North Korea, of course, has 60 nuclear weapons at least, you know, multiple different classes of ICBM. Um, and here's another problem I, I want to raise to your listeners is... Russia and China have um, developed about 10 strategic nuclear delivery systems that they have are now operational during the last 30 years versus R1. So we now have a nuclear arsenal, which in the case of the Minuteman 3 missiles is about 50 years old. It was first deployed in 1970, 51 years ago. Um, our Trident 2 missiles are our, missile our newest. Yeah, those are our newest ones, but they're still 30 plus years old. Um, and the and going uh, the Ohio nuclear missile submarines are you know well beyond their their life uh, you know if we don't replace them with Columbia class nuclear missile submarines we won't have a triad anymore. Uh, how many tridents are left? How many Ohio classes? What about fifteen plus four SSGNs? So we have we have uh, eighteen Ohio cl- uh, class nuclear missile submarines, but four yeah four have been uh, turned into con- conventional missile only. So we have fourteen. Um, 14 remaining, two two of those are in refit at any one time. So we only have 12 operational, and eight of those are in port at any given time, thanks to Obama. Obama it used to only be half, now it's a third. It, no, it used to be two-thirds. So during the Cold War, we had we had two-thirds, um, what they call them off-tempo. Our operations tempo was two-thirds of our Ohio uh, nuclear missile submarines were at sea at any given time. Um, so if they're in port, in an in a, uh, enemy nuclear first strike, they could be easily destroyed taken out in minutes. with a single nuclear weapon, like two, it, two nuclear weapons at each of our, you know, one in each of our uh, nuclear missile submarines. And then if you have only four of them sailing around the entire world, how long would it take for those four to be sunk? Right. Well, well, yeah, so it, it depends. Depends, depends on whether, uh, I guess that that's a complicated question. The Ohio's are not new submarines. They're easier to track than they used to be. The Soviets can okay. detect radionuclides now, the refractive index of water from satellites. Yeah. So that's the problem is that technology, you know, we don't really know. We, ha- we don't have any good updates, at least unclassified, on the state of, you know, Russian and Chinese uh, underwater submarine uh, detection techno- technology. But it's, uh, I mean, the technology for them improved in, in the mid-1980s. So we can only imagine uh, most likely they can detect our subs up to a certain depth. Uh, perhaps by satellite or, or other detection systems. So that is a real threat. You know, there's so there's two Ohio's in the Atlantic at any time that are at sea, and two in the Pacific. And where's the Navy at with the Columbia's? So um, that's just, you know so the big problem is that Russia and China and North Korea have all modernized their their systems. I think Russia's at ninety to ninety five percent modernization. Where um, you know they're all they've all been modernized within the last. Uh, two decades um, with regards to U.S. program. Uh, so we actually have the House Armed Services Committee Chairman Adam Smith. He um, he wants to abolish our nuclear triad. He wants to make it not only not a dyad, but a, a <laughs> you know just a, a one one leg. He wants he wants there to be um, I think six Ohio nuclear missile submarines. Uh, he wants to abolish all of our ICBMs and all of our nuclear bombers. Um, as far as where we're at, you know, the Obama administration, um, when they signed the New Star Treaty, which was a terrible treaty, by the way, that, uh, you know, I was trying, hoping that Trump would scrap, but that Biden extended as soon as he became president. Um, that limits us to 1,550 uh, nuclear warheads each, deployed strategic warheads. And um, so that's kind of where we're at. But the Russians have been cheating 
and they've essentially been breaking out of the treaty limits. And so they have an estimated 2,400 strategic nuclear warheads. Um, according to Dr. Mark Schneider, they're uh, looking to get about 3,300. So they're going to have, uh, they already have um, with the, the Chinese over twice as many deployed strategic nuclear weapons than we do. Uh, and then including tactical and theater nuclear weapons, they have uh, about five times as many as we do. So we're in a world of hurt. And no one seems to recognize where we're at, not, not our members of Congress, not the Biden administration. Um, they don't understand that, that our current nuclear deterrent is, it's, is uh, too small uh, to, be, you know, to be sure about deterring an attack. Would Russia invade Ukraine first or would China invade Taiwan first? You don't think that either of those conflicts are inevitable, or do you? So as part of my sphere of influence agreement, so um, going back to Yalta, you know, I believe that the Yalta Agreement was a pretty big betrayal of freedom, and I believe that Churchill was mostly responsible for that. Um, the Yalta Agreement, for our listeners, was when uh, that was when the decision to cede Eastern Europe to the Soviets, uh, Soviets uh, enslavement and subjugation, was um, approved by FDR and Churchill, and that that agreement actually had been done between Churchill and Stalin uh, back at the Fourth Moscow Conference in 1944. Um, but what I propose is kind of, uh, you know, divide the world. And this is, by the way, this is, a you know, our foreign policy, U.S. foreign policy thinks this is, you know, calls it appeasement. Uh, but it's just basically stating the reality of the world which we live in. Uh, so my agreement would transform our, uh, the bilateral or um, international order to a trilateral lateral national uh, international order. And the reason for doing that is, you know, I went to Georgetown, I uh, got a master's in national security studies. And part of my thesis was that the number one national security imperative for the U.S. was to divide uh, the burgeoning Sino-Russian alliance between Russia and China. Because in a, in a war, any war between with Russia or China, we're going to face the other one, most likely because of, of this alliance. And so we need to... Um, we need to divide them so we're not facing two nuclear sub- superpowers against our one. Are Russia and China natural allies, or is it more of a situation of the enemy of my enemy is my friend, where the enemy of Russia is the United States? Yeah. And and they, they both are, are allied only in their their disdain for the United States, or is it a geographic thing? Why so, are they so closely aligned? So that, uh, that is a really good question, and it's it's really kind of a marriage of convenience in all, in all truth. Uh, Russia and China actually, uh, most would argue, are, are natural enemies. Um, however, and, and so you, you think of, well, why are they allied? And the answer is because the U.S. has had this uh, policy of military confrontation, which is, um, you know, essentially we've, we're trying to contain both countries, and we're trying to, con- you know, con- we have forces on their very borders, you know, uh, in the case of Japan, South Korea, uh, not not Taiwan. We don't have any U.S. military forces in Taiwan, but we we often send our even even Biden has, has sent um, you know U.S. Uh, carrier aircraft groups um, in the Taiwan Strait. So very provocative. And then in the case of Russia, we have troops stationed in multiple former Soviet republics, including you know of course the Baltic republics and uh, Central Asia, uh, Central Asian republics as well. So that's provocative. So they're ticked off about that. And, you know, I don't know what, you know, what is it in, what in the world is making, um, you know, U.S. leaders say that we should, you know, suggest we should defend Ukraine. We have no, we have no uh, defense, you know, alliance agreements with either Ukraine or, or Taiwan. Taiwan, of course, we have kind of a moral, um, you know, kind of a alliance or history with. Uh, but with with regards to Ukraine, Ukraine has been part of Russia for many centuries, and so Russia has a legitimate claim to Ukraine. Uh, of course, I support Ukrainian independence. But the question, the ultimate question that needs to be asked by U.S. policymakers is: Is it worth the deaths of over 200 million Americans, which would likely be the cost in the case of a nuclear million of a nuclear two thirds of the United States? Yes, a nuclear or EMP war. So. Um, <laughs> As you mentioned, I am the deputy director of uh, national operations for the EMP task force on national homeland security. And the EMP commission, um, back in, I think in 2007 or eight, they issued a report um, in which they predicted that an EMP attack, electromagnetic pulse attack in the US by conducted by Russia, China, and North Korea could uh, cause the death of 90% of the population. 
So we're, we're talking about maybe 273. Up to 273 million Americans could be killed in an EMP attack. 273 um, mega deaths. Isn't that the term they use? Yeah. Mega death. Um, so, so that's what could happen in EMP attack. And, that, and that's likely um, even more uh, casualties that would, that would die more Americans than even in a, in a limited nuclear strike. So a super, uh, um, in a super EMP attack, there'd be a, an, an enhanced EMP uh, nuclear weapon that uh, would be exploded above the U.S. at a very high altitude and would knock out all the power, uh, cars, uh, all the electronics, uh, internet, you know, satellites uh, in, above the U.S., in the U.S., um, continental U.S., uh, that would shut down the food di uh, distribution system. You know, it would shut down running water. Uh, people would starve in place. We Emergency services would be lost. I mean, it what, really what, is What a, kind of electronics would survive an EMP attack? So it's debatable. Uh, so... For sure, we know that cars that were built before 1980 would still, would not be adversely affected because they don't have, I think, catalytic converters, computer chips. Um, so my old Corvette cell that, phones, I, that I've got is, yeah, is a good thing to hold on. It's, you should keep that. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, of course, uh, gas wouldn't pump if it was, even if there was, you know, there was gas still available. Um, uh, small electronics, um, some people say possibly laptops, could still function. Um, uh, most cell phones might still function, but the problem is um, there wouldn't be an internet. It wouldn't just be a temporary outage. Uh, even in a cyber attack situation, they could potentially knock out the internet, um, our satellites, and uh, um, you know the power for permanently, indefinitely. And we don't have any good defenses. You know, we talk about national defense. We spend, the Biden administration has uh, proposed a small increase in, na in national defense spending up to $715 billion. It's very small. And it's the way it's being spent, it's insufficient for our needs. Um, but we don't have a credible defense against EMP attack. We have only 44 ABM missile, uh, you know, nuclear missile interceptors at Fort Greeley in Alaska, and then uh, a limited number of uh, standard three and uh, six ABMs um, on our uh, HS cruisers and destroyers. You know, that's our only defense against nuclear missile attack. The ones in Alaska don't, they can't defend against Russia because uh, they go over, they're designed, they're aimed against, I used to work for the Missile Defense Agency, by the way, but they're aimed against uh, North Korea with a limited ability against China. So, and then cyber attack, you know, I mean, China alone has at least an army of 60,000 people that are hackers that. You know, his mission is to, to shut off our uh, electronic capabilities in the event of war with the U.S. And the danger is, is that they could blind in a cyber, uh, a cyber attack, you know, nuclear or a cyber attack Pearl Harbor type surprise attack. They could potentially blind us um, by taking out our, our early warning satellites, so that we wouldn't even we wouldn't know who attacked us, and we wouldn't know if they were still attacking us, where they were attacking us. I mean, they could be invading other countries. They could have nuclear missiles in the air. And it's, you know, if you can imagine uh, the movie War Games, you know, where they were, you know, they showed missiles oh. in the air on a computer screen. Imagine that computer screen uh, going black. What would we do? When I speak with people that I know, especially millennials or younger generation, they think that World War II is something long in the past. And that people back then were so ignorant and naive of all that they've learned in elementary school or wherever it is that they've been. And I tend to see the current world as still being in almost an aftershock from World War II. That it's it's an event that is so close in time yeah. to what we're living in now that its effects are still being felt. And even that the aftermath of the war is still being sorted out. The decisions that Churchill made and that the United States made are still affecting us today in, in these ways that you're talking about. I mean, do you agree yeah. with that? Yeah, that's or, absolutely or... right. So, um, you know, in the case of World War I, World War I uh, gave, you know, we, we supposedly won World War I, and we did militarily, but it gave birth to Nazism, communism. Nazism, of course, became extinct after World War II, but then we, we gave, essentially gave the German and the Japanese empires their colonial possessions over to the, the Soviets, except for the case of Western Europe, which we liberated. So um, we definitely are, you know, dealing with those those um, bad decisions that were made. And you know, the internationalists uh, talk about, you know, the globalists. They talk about uh, the need to preserve 
the international order that we created in 1945. Um, and with the exception of the fall of China to the communists, it's, it hasn't changed all that much. But it's mm. very adverse, you know, to us. You know, back then we had U.S. nuclear supremacy. You know, we had sole possession of, of nuclear weapons until 1949, and then we continue to have nuclear supremacy over our enemies beyond that for a time until uh, through the 1950s. And now that the tables are turned, you know, the, the uh, Russians and Chinese have may have achieved nuclear supremacy over us, and we're not doing anything about it to restore uh, rough nuclear parity. But, you know, you're absolutely right, because the problem is, um, I see that, you know, a lot of people don't really, um, they haven't learned the lessons, the true lessons of World War II. And it's much more complicated than, you know, uh, you know, appeasement was the wrong thing to do. It's more about miscalculation. Um, so the only leader, national leader that wanted World War II to happen was Stalin. And he was the, the prime beneficiary in the winter, as we talked about, you know, with the communists mm -hmm. taking over uh, four times more people than they had at the beginning of the war. The Soviets were allowed to annex parts of nine countries by the Allies at the end of the war, um, as well as, of course, Eastern Europe and later, you know, mainland China, North Japan, and North Korea. But the problem is, um, the lesson of World War II is, the al you know, the allies, the U.S. and its allies should never um, have a military guarantee to a country that they don't have the ability to defend. So in the case of Britain and France, they guaranteed Poland from attack by Germany that Hitler hadn't even considered yet. And the result of that was World War II. It turned a, a German-Polish war, which would, later would have morphed to a German-Soviet war, into a war that was, you know, encompassed all of Europe and, you know, later the world. So in this case with Ukraine, we don't have the military ability to credibly defend Ukraine. By the time we had enough forces in Eastern Europe to try to respond, Ukraine would be overrun by the Russians. You know, they have the ability to overrun Ukraine in a matter of probably a couple of weeks, maybe, maybe less. And so if, if we keep trying to, you know, threaten Russia and China uh, with the defense of, of countries that we don't have any commitments to, um, it's the, the chances of, of war breaking out and uh, a nuclear war that would cause the U.S. to cease to exist as a nation uh, become much, much higher. Does some of this mean in your mind that Churchill wasn't quite the leader we thought he was or FDR? Is that going too far? Should, should people have listened to General Patton in World War II? Yes, yes. General Patton and General MacArthur are my heroes. Um, Churchill, you know, I liked him early on, and then the more I studied him, the more I realized that he, you know, he was he was a great anti-communist until 1936 when, when Hitler occupied uh, the Rhineland, and then he suddenly switched. He became very pro-Soviet, uh, and he was very pro-Soviet up until night he gave his, uh, you know, his speech about the Iron Curtain that he helped create, by the way, in 1946. He, uh, he more than any other man on the West was responsible for the Iron Curtain. Very, and then, of course, he hypocritically condemned it. Uh, but yeah, Churchill and FDR, you know, they did a great job in defeating Nazi Germany. But, um, you know, neither one really cared about Europe. You know, they, they, uh, FDR um, stated that he uh, didn't care who controlled continental Europe. You know, he cared about Britain. He cared about Britain remaining free. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a big part of why he got the Japanese provoke them to attack us at Pearl Harbor as a backdoor to war against Germany, which is the subject of, you know, another another program if we, if we ever want to do that one. But um, it is interesting, and I'll just say, of course, when you're raised is when you're young, being taught that Churchill and FDR were heroes. At least yeah. I was, maybe maybe not as much I was now. As well. Then you get a little bit older and you think that you're so smart because you know that they're heroes. But the... One point, you know, one percent of the one percent that really study history themselves often come to the conclusion that you have just said, which is that they weren't quite the heroes yeah. that that they're portrayed to be. And I hear that on both sides of the Atlantic. I hear that from people who've studied this in England it, itself. Churchill is their their greatest national hero over there, and so it, it is interesting to consider that perspective and that maybe World War II didn't turn out exactly the way. It should have. Yeah, so this is part of our liberal media problem. Um, it's not just the media, but, you know, um, I call them liberal liberal establishment court historians. Essentially, they wrote history, World War II history, the, the way they wanted us to believe it. So they call World War II the good war, 
for the reason that it no war in history did more to advance the cause of communism of the far left. You know, so you would think that why you know why would liberal uh, liberal media and politicians be so pro Soviet, so pro communist, given that communists have, you know, if you think about communist China, they've killed uh, by my estimation um, up to seventy five times more than Hitler, including forced abortion and infanticide. So they've killed about a billion people, a billion innocents. And yet, you know, we have and nobody talks about. I it. mean, our own state governor, you know, our our uh, president, you know, talks about oh, we have to keep trading with China. You know, it's okay to build them up until this COVID thing, you know, hit and it's kind of a hard dose of reality that we, you know, we really needed. But um, they really, um, you know, kind of rewrote history to make us believe that liberal icons like Truman, um, FDR, Churchill, Marshall, even Eisenhower, you know, all of these people were were very pro-Soviet at the time and, and were responsible for the debacle uh, in seeding so much of the world of communism that, that we're suffering, you know, from today, Russia's not communism, communist anymore, but they're controlled by the same uh, ex-communist elite. And now the KGB, uh, they call themselves the FSB, Siloviki. You know, so that's that's kind of Putin's uh, ruling elite. That's been uh, he's been had in power for the last 21 years. Do you mind if we take a quick caller? Absolutely. And then I've got a few questions. Caller, you're on the air. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you just fine. So you were talking about cybersecurity. That's and, right. Uh, We've got Dave Pine with us. <laughs> you'll never be safe from it as long as you keep using it. It's almost like this whole narrative of the Russians and the China, the Chinese and the big threats. And I mean, we, we you're right. The whole everyone's thinking about COVID nineteen. I, I I just I'm dumbfounded on you know the the way people think in this well, country. Yeah, let me just say that I, I think COVID-19, it's obviously a, a valid concern. Uh, COVID-19, I believe, was uh, represented a Chinese biological warfare attack in the United States. Uh, very difficult to respond to. It's cost the lives of nearly 600,000 um, Americans, but it all has also, you know, caused all these uh, restrictions on freedom uh, that have really, you know, kind of, and, you know, the lockdowns, um, business restrictions, Travel restrictions. Well, basically, COVID nineteen's never been sterilized or isolated in any laboratory in the in the world. So when they when they diagnose you with COVID nineteen, your your little cell that has that COVID nineteen visual in it also has about thirty thousand, thirty million other viruses in it. And the stuff that we we are believing, we're all worried about nuclear war. Why don't we shut down all these laboratories around the world that are creating all these all doing all this mischief with viruses and bio warfare. Yeah, I mean that's that's uh, it's definitely a concern. You know, the Wuhan um, Institute um, is uh, China's primary um, biological warfare lab, and it, it was revealed that during you know during the Obama administration, the National Institute of Health, which I believe is led by still led by Dr. Fauci, you know, provided three I think three and a half million, three point eight million worth in funding. Uh, I think it was specifically, well, it was, it was actually to supposedly help uh, fund uh, greater safety protocols, but we basic, you know, he basically was involved in, in helping them um, indirectly, at least, um, you know, with this uh, COVID research that they later used to, to attack us once it was inadvertently left let out of the lab. And but, so we, we paid to cut our own risk, basically. It's definitely a less. It should be a lesson learned on what not to do. Yes. Now I wanted to go back. I mean, we're getting we're getting fleeced so badly as a taxpayer in this country, with monies going un. You know, you know, it's going everywhere. And nobody knows where it's going. They're printing it like crazy and they're putting it on the backs of our children. It's yeah, it's just insane. I just want to yeah. I just want to uh, quickly address the other issue you raised, which is cyber warfare. So cyber warfare is has become an ex- existential threat to the United States. Uh, both China and Russia are cur- and and North Korea are currently engaged in uh, what people would call a, a low intensity war against the United States, um, and that is with cyber warfare and other forms of warfare. Um, with the cyber attack, um, Russia and China. Are believed by U.S. intelligence to have the ability to completely shut off the inter- internet, as well as uh, the U.S. electrical power grid, 
Um, I've had experts tell me that they also ha- have the likely have the ability to shut down our GPS and early warning satellites, which would blind us to an, any incoming follow-on attacks by uh, the Sina Russian Alliance. But uh, thank you for your call. Thank you, caller. Yeah, take care, buddy. Because time is short, tell us really quick about North Korea. North Korea really a threat to South Korea? Yeah. So What's going to happen to them? You know, so I, I've had this discussion before. Um, so w- in the case of the U.S. and U.S. allies, it's in our interest for every, you know, all of our major allies to have nuclear weapons. You know, we've had this non-proliferation regime. Uh, it would be great if Japan had nukes. It would be great if South Korea had nukes. It would be great if Taiwan had nukes or Germany. All those countries could help defend themselves, and we wouldn't have to worry so much about, you know, keeping them. And instead, we, you know, we've decided to, you know, kind of monopolize the U.S., U.K., and France have the nukes, and pretty much none of our allies, except for Israel, do. And so, yes, North Korea is a huge threat, not just to South Korea. You know, it could easily overrun South Korea uh, using kind of these new weapons, you know, cyber weapons, EMP weapons, nuclear weapons. South Korea doesn't have any of those. You know, they have a, a good, con- strong conventional military, but they don't have weapons that, you know, super weapons that Putin talks about that could, you know, th- they could use to defeat the U.S. and its allies, you know, in a day, essentially. Are we are we likely to see a coup in the near future in North Korea? What would that look like, and what would happen to the nukes if it happened? I think there's almost no chance of a coup. You know, the thing about communist dictators is they're, they're very good at eliminating opposition. Stalin, you know, infamously killed a lot of, his own supporters, you know, just to keep everyone looking over their shoulder. So he had a, uh, killed a lot of army general generals, you know, in the 1937 uh, cleansing of uh, the Soviet army. And a lot of those were good communist, you know, pro-communist generals. Um, so I don't think that's going to happen. Um, I don't see that ever happening. Actually, I don't see how North Korea is, you know, overthrows the communist dictator. Kim Jong-un. But isn't Kim Jong Kim Jong Un? I mean, he, I mean, his health is bad, right? He's in his he's early overweight. Thir- he's in his early thirties, and there there were rumors about he's thirty three, maybe thirty four. But uh, there were rumors that he, you know, he was off the grid for a while, and there were rumors he he had died of a heart attack. It was being reported by uh, some South Korean uh, journalists that he he passed on, and North Koreans just were afraid to, you know, they're still sorting out the succession whether it's going to be his his uh, younger sister is the you know, the new dear leader or not. That obviously didn't happen. He's been in, he's been in public several times since then. Um, but they, you know, they have like five different IC, four or five different ICBM classes. They have an SLBM. And they've, unfortunately, they've done a lot of it, a lot of that during the Trump administration. Um, you know, President Trump, one thing I disagree with him on is, you know, he basically said North Korea is no longer a threat because I, I met with him. I met with uh, Kim Jong-un and we're buddies now. <laughs> It doesn't seem like he did that. So, you know, I trust him. And so in three minutes, what's the solution to it all? What do we need to do beyond increasing our nuclear arsenal and and nuclear deterrence here in the country? So President Biden has called for a summit with uh, Russian President Putin that would would discuss the full range of of issues, uh, uh, problems that Russia has with us. I think that's a really smart thing to do. I think he needs to do it sooner than later. We need to... You know, we have about 2,000 uh, strategic nuclear weapons in reserve. It would take six to six months to two years to deploy those, redeploy those. That would vastly increase our nuclear arsenal. Uh, we need to build nas- a national missile defense system. All of this would take years. Um, and we need to harden the electrical uh, power grid. It would take as little as $2 billion to harden it. Uh, to do a full job of all our critical infrastructure, it would take about $30 billion. Uh, just, you know, as a point of reference, that's like half a percent, quarter percent of what uh, Biden's defense budget is. So, uh, you know, easily. We could easily have the money to do that. And we could do it. You know, one, one encouraging thing is the Biden administration has talked about the need to increase the resilience of our critical infrastructure and, our, and the grid. As far as this white paper, you know, I, I was the principal, one of the principal authors of this white paper that we gave to the Biden administration um, while they were still in the transition team. And they've responded favorably. You know, I, I don't have all the details. I can't get all the all the details, but um, they are uh, interested in what we have to say as the MP task force. Is part of the long-term problem, I mean, you've described short-term solutions, remediate the situation. Is the long-term solution just educating people about the issue? How can that happen? Yeah, we have to educate our policymakers and the public. You know, educating the public will pressure the policymakers to do the right thing and, and 
you know, stop their dereliction of duty and actually build defenses against these types of enemy super weapons. Uh, we have to do that. Um, back to your previous question, what the solution is for Ukraine and Taiwan. We need to make it clear to Ukraine and Taiwan, Taiwan leaders, uh, Taiwanese leaders, that we don't have the ability to defend them and that they need to, um, they need to not be provocative towards Russia and China and they need to find common ground and try to resolve it. And sadly, that may, that may include you know, some form of reunification with Russia and China. And there, I imagine the Biden administration will be more receptive than the Trump administration, if that's in your white papers. If we had the military capabilities we had during World War II, when we were, you know, had nuclear supremacy during the uh, 40s, late 40s and early 50s, you know, I, I'd be much more willing to entertain, you know, absolute resistance at Russia and China's borders. But we are militarily inferior, and so we need to pull back uh, military, U.S. military forces from Eastern Europe, from mi the Middle East, from Central Asia, you know, kind of re rewrite um, our defense line so that it does not include Eastern Europe, does not include Taiwan. We can still defend South Korea. I have proposals for that as well. But mainly we need to, we need to make it clear to Russia and China that we are willing to recognize the sphere of influence. Ideally, if we had the, the chance, we, we would ally with the Russians against the Chinese. We only got five seconds left in the program. Dave, I appreciate you being with us. I wish we had more time. We'll have you back soon. You're with KTOG, AM 1640, The Voice of Utah. We just hit the top of the hour. The news is coming on. I'm Steve Reinhardt, signing off with Dave Pine. Appreciate him being with us. Thanks, Dave. Thanks. Britain's Prince Philip is remembered earlier today. We therefore pray that God will give us grace to follow his example and that with our brother Philip, at the last, we shall